Hello, we're Andy, the maniacal cinephile, and welcome to Boots to Reboots. Last summer, I reviewed Jaws for its 40th anniversary. So this summer, I'm watching the remake of what Spielberg called the best of the Jaws ripoffs. Piranha. What's scarier, one big fish or many tiny fish? Like, would you rather fight Andre the Giant or a dozen Danny DeVitos? All of these shitty remakes Is there a single jam? They did it right already Kill the kettle with them Which any app we watching Which personality? One thing for sure good people We got some movies to see We got The 1978 original was produced by Roger Corman and directed by Joe Dante. Impressed, Spielberg later hired Joe Dante as director on the Twilight Zone movie, Gremlins, and Small Soldiers. The original tells the story of Maggie, a female P.I., and Grogan, a drunk outdoorsman, who stumble upon an abandoned military base and accidentally release genetically mutated piranhas into the river, leading to a summer resort where all hell breaks loose. Maybe the piranhas are trying to cover them in kisses. The effects were done by Phil Tippett and a 17-year-old Rob Bottin, who'd later give us the glorious creatures from The Thing. In 2010, Piranha 3D was released, serving as a very loose remake of the original. If anything, drop the D and call it Piranha 3. It was written by Jigsaw and Spiral writers Pete Goldfinger and Josh Stolberg. The remake was directed by Alexandra Aja, who directed the remake of The Hills Have Eyes and produced the remake of Maniac. So let's cross the remake of Piranha off the list and see if it deserves... The Boot. Uh-oh, Aja still thinks he's making The Hills Have Eyes. Wait until I tell my 43 kids I was in a movie! Fisherman Matt Hooper... Show me the way to go home. Sorry, I mean Matt Boyd. ...is fishing in Lake Victoria when he drops his Amity beer, causing an earthquake which splits the lake floor and causes a whirlpool. It's sad how his career has gone down the drain. <laughs> Little buddy, don't you say it. He's gonna need a bigger boat. <sighs> Hooper, I mean Boyd, falls in and is ripped apart by an emerging school of piranhas. Nope, those are Universal's copyright lawyers. Hooper can't wait to tell Quint how he got those scars. As spring break begins, Jake Forrester bumps into his old crush Kelly and meets her douchey boyfriend, Todd Dupree. Hey, hey, ass boy. Cool shirt. Yeah, don't do that. It gave me flashbacks to the... Theater incident. Jake meets Derek Jones, a sleazy pornographer, as well as Danny, one of his girls gone wild. I mean, wild, wild girls. Try not to stare at her boobs. Oh, shut up. 
They say it's not polite to stare. Derek convinces Jake to show him the good spots on the lake. The job, location scout, guide us around, show us all the good spots, the G-spots. Yes, show us the G-spot. Our dead father's map is confusing. Why does an X mark the G-spot? Jake's mom, Sheriff Julie Forrester, played by Back to the Future 2 and 3's Elizabeth Shue, searches for the missing Matt Boyd with Deputy Fallon, played by Ving Rames. Ving Rames? Oh, please, he's gotta fire a shotgun. See? Another boating accident. Well, this is not a boat accident. She wants to close the beach. However, the thousands of spring breakers bring a lot of revenue to this small town. Blah, blah, blah. We've seen Jaws. Meh, we give the dive a three. Me, when my foot touches some seaweed. Jake runs into Kelly, who accepts Derek's invitation on board his party boat. We meet Derek's other actress, Crystal, and his cameraman. I've seen that guy charm the pants off a lot of ladies. He's like a snake charmer. Except his snakes do all the blowing. Uh, speaking of going wild, we haven't seen anything yet. They're going to a gambling den to play Russian roulette. Our boy Jake then gets treated to an underwater show. Wow, these 3D glasses really work. Oh. I never saw this at the aquarium. Check it out. It's like fish with boobies. Aren't those mermaids? For their synchronized underwater nude scene, Kelly Brook and Riley Steele spent two weeks training. And I finished in two seconds. Without a sitter, Jake's siblings Zane and Laura take a canoe to go fishing. However, they get stranded on an island after Zane fails to secure the canoe. I must have gotten my knots mixed up. The last thing David Carradine said in that closet. While waving down a boat, Laura steps on some glass and leaks Hawaiian punch into the lake. Yes, I smell notes of citrus and Play-Doh. Julie takes a team of seismologist divers, Novak, Sam, and Paula, to the site of the quake. Novak speculates that the rift leads to a buried prehistoric lake. A lake. Under a lake. <gasps> Lakeception. Paula and Sam, surprisingly not naked, dive to the bottom and discover a big cavern filled with large piranha eggs. I bet they're tasty. Spread on some toast. However, before they can warn the others, both are killed. Today we remember Sam and Paula. We knew them well. Well, not really. I'll never forget Paula's last words. <laughs> Novak and Julie find Paula's corpse and pull it onto the boat. Oh my god! Someone give her CPR! Back on the Barracuda, Jake and Kelly are talked into doing a belly shot. But Kelly blows it. Chunks, that is. Oh, oh, no! No! Ugh, I hate 3D movies. <laughs> Julian Novak capture a lone CGI piranha and take it to Carl Goodman, a retired marine biologist. The store is closed! Jennifer! Great Adam Scott! I want to know what the hell this thing is doing in my lake. It was a long interrogation, but the perp ain't talking. 
And something about him is fishy. There are thousands of them. Thousands. And they're pissed. Like when Fox canceled Firefly. Goodman explains that it's a highly aggressive prehistoric species known as Pygocentris natureri, or the original piranha. Doc, so you're telling me there are piranhas in the lake? Oh, that's heavy. We learned this type of piranha has been extinct for two million years. Goodman would know. He was there. The first bite draws blood, the blood draws the pack. Just like fans of K-pop. How are we going to stop them? Yesterday would have been a good time to start. So what you're saying is we gotta go back in time. While Jake records a topless woman parasailing, he spots his siblings trapped on the island. What a lame adaptation of The Lord of the Flies. Revealing that his mom is the sheriff, Jake forces Derek to rescue Zane and Laura. However, the propeller gets caught in some seaweed. Oh, oh, hey, hey. Look out! He has plenty of experience! from choking his chicken. Near the beach, our topless parasailer is devoured. <sighs> I never get to fly my kite. Horror film director Eli Roth makes a cameo judging a wet t-shirt contest. In 3D. She can really poke an eye out with those. Fallon tries to evacuate the lake, but his warning is ignored by the spring breakers. Because who doesn't want to become fish poop? Not me. The piranhas arrive, swimming right past a bunch of limbs to attack this one girl's bottom. <laughs> oh. They must have smelt the blood in the water. The piranhas attack, turning the party into one hell of a bloodbath. Her parents told her this would happen. The tourists try to get out of the water, but the piranhas won't be upstaged. <laughs> okay, say it. You're gonna need a bigger stage! <sighs> when you're swarmed after opening a new pack of gum. <laughs> when the producers asked her if she'd go topless, she was split. <laughs> Novak boards a jet ski with a shotgun to help while the rest of the team tries to save the others. Ironically, I could see Eli Roth dying in a motorboating accident. What? He was clearly in a gang. While the sheriff struggles to save everyone she can, the douchey Todd steals a boat and runs over numerous people until someone's hair gets snagged in the propeller. <laughs> Let's face it. Some ladies would die for that skin peel. Her pores do look nice. Almost everyone in the lake is either wounded, dismembered, or killed by the piranhas. Wow. Her spring break is really falling apart. Aha! Another cameo! Here we see Greg Nicotero literally carrying this movie with his special effects. Meanwhile, Deputy Fallon unloads with his shotgun. Oh, hell yeah! But it's not enough. He takes a boat motor and uses it to shred the piranhas. Ah! Ah! No! No! Dude, relax. Rames isn't dead. He comes back in the sequel. 
bring me my legs. Shotguns for legs? That's going on my bucket list. And that, boils and ghouls, is a gorehound's wet dream. Excuse me, Mr. Aja, how much fake blood do you want? Yes. Hey, who won the wet t-shirt contest? Derek crashes the boat, flooding the lower deck, and trapping Kelly in the kitchen while Derek and Crystal are thrown overboard. Reminds me of goldfish crackers, the snack that smiles back. On this trip, it's the second worst thing she's had in her mouth. Her implants are like... Day seven, and the jellyfish still haven't realized we're fake. Danny manages to get a partially eaten Derek back on board. Derek, they took my penis! They took my penis! Are you sure they took it? Because I can't really tell. The first time someone ever gagged on his baloney pony. Jake finally calls his mom to tell her the pack round is trying to escape. <sighs> of course, in cinematography, this is sometimes called the Jaws shot. So Julie and Novak find Jake and attach a rope to his boat. They start to cross, but the piranhas latch onto Danny's hair. <laughs> With a face like that, Maybe she has a future in phone sex. 1-800-BUTTERFACE. The others make it across safely, but Jake ties the line to himself and goes to save Kelly. So his character arc is that he went to kiss a girl and she didn't vomit. Jake releases some gas, rigs a flare, and as the piranhas close in, Novak speeds away. And then they were all arrested for killing an endangered species. Of course, the piranhas would have been dead already if the visitors kept littering. Besides for the piranha, the only thing this movie shares in common with the original is that our characters are dragged to safety. Don't worry, Grogan was so drunk, he didn't feel a thing. Mr. Goodman calls Julie and reveals the piranha they obtained wasn't an adult. What are you talking about? It has no mature reproductive organs. Uh, should he be telling the sheriff the fish was underage? They're the babies. And babies? Where are the parents? I wondered the same thing when Andy let me watch this movie. But then I remembered. Our parents are dead. You know what? I would have won that wet t-shirt contest. How? You can't even wear a shirt. Or get wet. <laughs> Piranha 3D is dumb. It barely has a plot or much character development. However, when we get to the third act, the movie redeems itself. It's a sleazy, gory, and entertaining B-movie. It's exactly what you expect from a movie about killer fish loose on spring break. That over-the-top massacre sequence alone turned this from campy trash to masterpiece. The movie knows it's ridiculous and doesn't take itself seriously at all. It's a schlocky guilty pleasure that takes the tongue-in-cheek humor of the original and cranks it. To quote the legend Al Bundy, that was a beautiful, lovely movie. I saw 22 hooters, a bunch of guys were killed, and it had no story at all. <laughs> it had everything.
<laughs> Piranha 3D did so well that it got a sequel in 2012 titled Piranha 3 Double D. So does Alexandra Aja's remake of Piranha deserve the boot? Nah. However, what does deserve the boot is this. In 1995, Roger Corman produced a remake of Piranha for Showtime. Rather than shoot new special effects for the film, Corman recycled the shots from the 1978 original. The screenplay is scene for scene identical, however all humor and camp was removed. The only noteworthy thing is the remake features Mila Kunis in her debut role. Also, in the TV version, the doggo gets eated. For being a bland, rushed, made-for-TV remake, recycling old effects, and offering nothing new, the 1995 remake of Piranha is getting the boot! It's time to bite back! This has been Andy, the Maniacal Cinephile. Thanks for liking and subscribing. We'll see you next time.